Praise the Lord. It feel good, don't it? That right there is thanks to be in the house of the Lord this morning. It is Sunday morning, April the 14th, 2024. None of us know what the other person had to go through to get from Monday to Sunday. But I am convinced, like Paul says in Philippians 1 through 6, 1, 1, 6, being confident in this, that he who began a good work in us will carry it through to completion. Amen? Until the day of Christ. Amen. I ask you to stand as the choir sings every praise. Feel free to sing along because I know you know the words and the lyrics. Amen.
the Lord. God, my Savior. God, my healer. God, my deliverer. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Our responsive call to worship this morning. If you have your bullets, and say amen. Our long journey through the darkness is over. No more do we need to fear. Jesus lives in our hearts and our spirits. Hallelujah. Please, before you be seated this morning, greet your neighbor. Good morning, good morning, good morning. And you may be seated. Our hymn of prayer will be 176 O. How I Love Jesus, and our morning prayer will be done by Sister Cheryl Adams. church. Um, that's one of the old gospel songs. I just love uh, the old songs. A lot of those songs are uh, prayers um, that have been put to music. And if you look at the hymnal, there's a verse that's in between there and it says, to me, it's so wonderful. To me, it's so wonderful. To me, it's so wonderful to know that Jesus is mine. Let us pray. Lord, most holy, Lord, all wise and all caring God, we thank you for last night's lying down and this morning's early rising. Lord, you woke us up in our right mind and we're able to, we were able to stand and prepare a meal and we made our way to the church to worship you one more time. Thank you, Lord. We pray for those who are not here uh, due to sickness or uh, some other incapacity or uh, those who just could not uh, see their way to come here today. We pray for them, Lord, that they will 
be here uh, the next time that we come to sing and pray and worship your holy name. We pray for those who are sick and shut in among us. Lord, we ask for healing in the name of Jesus. O oh, most gracious God, you're the great physician, and you can do all things well, even more things than we can ever think of or ask for. We ask, Lord, that you heal those who are sick, yes. whether physical or mental, yes. and those who have uh, anger issues. Lord, we have a real problem in our society. Yes. We're quick, quick to pick up a gun and shoot and kill someone for over little or nothing. Lord, we just ask that you would uh, grant us peace, that you would uh, bring us to the table of communication, uh, help our young people to uh, know how to deal with each other and how to care and to love each other and not be so quick to end someone's life unnecessarily for the least little thing. We pray for our pastor. Uh, give him the strength to preach your truth to us so that we will know what is your good and perfect will for us. Bless his family that walks by his side. Bless his church and bless the care partners uh, here. Bless your church universal, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now as Jesus taught his disciples, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Praise the Lord, Sister Cheryl Adams, for that prayer. Amen. At this time, we want to invite any first-time visitor to stand. We're just going to show you some love. We're not going to make you say nothing. I promise. Well, we want to show some love to those who are visiting online for the first time who we can't see. Amen. 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 Our announcements as follows. Bible study. You guys know Wednesdays 6.30, Fridays at 11. Up next, we have our Prime Timers Luncheon, which is um, an amazing uh, atmosphere, something to be a part of. I really want to do that, Pastor. Um, I mean, just to hang out and, and soak up some of the wisdom, you know. I really want to do that. <laughs> I could take a day off, Brother Dennis, and do it. You're right. You're right. Up next, we have our prayer breakfast. Um, you guys can see Saturday, April 20th, and that's going to be from 8.30 to 10. Please RSVP by this coming Wednesday, all right? Amen? Amen. Amen. Up next, we have our community cleanup. That is next Saturday, um, April 20th. 10 a.m., what we're going to do, we're going to partner with Keep Indy Beautiful, and we're going to clean up the neighborhood. Um, meet here at 945. Coffee and donuts will be provided. Pastor, are they Long's donuts? Jack's, all right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> and all things give thanks. <laughs> Jacks will do. Um, our birthdays this week. Um, Sister Regina Turner Barclay, please stand. Doc, happy birthday. And your birthday is today. Amen. Up next, um, Winsome Davis, did I say that right? Please stand. S Sister Winsome. All right, amen. 
up next, um, now if I mess your name up, say a prayer for me. Is it Kam Kamala or Camila? Camilla. Camilla Nichols, please stand up. Okay, she's in Sunday school. Happy birthday, Camilla. And then last but certainly not least, um, Brother Brandon Woodson. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And at this time, we're going to ask Brother Roscoe to come up and make a special. Um, there, where's Brother? Oh, there he is. I know. Okay, Jack's Donuts, huh? <laughs> okay. Morning, church. It's a beautiful day today. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to ask that you guys get your pens, pencils, markers out, because I got some important dates that are coming up. You don't have one? We'll make sure you get it. Okay. We got some important dates that I want to share with you as it relates to our upcoming seventh year of service celebration for Pastor Wallace and Sister Carla, okay? So <clears throat> please join us as we celebrate their seven years of service for our church. Saturday, April 27th will be the men's or luncheon, which starts at noon. That will be for Pastor Wallace. On the 4th of May, we have First Lady's, First Lady Carla's seventh year anniversary luncheon as well. Then we're going to come back on May the 5th, where we have a worship service, where we have a keynote speaker will be Pastor Ken Rush. We got those three dates down? Everybody's written them down, right? All right. This time of celebration will not be the same without you. On behalf of the elder board, we would like to invite you to express your own appreciation for the ministry that Pastor Wallace and Carla have provided by giving to this year's Pastor's Anniversary Love Offering. Okay? You can contribute cash or checks made payable to Dr. Wallace McLaughlin. Let me repeat that one more time for us. You can contribute cash checks, money orders, okay, <laughs> made payable to Pastor Wallace McLaughlin. <laughs> Cash app, we're working on that, <clears throat> okay? No, in all seriousness, I don't know about Cash app. But no. no, okay. Uh, but please make sure that you make out your checks, money order, cash, to payable to Dr. Wallace McLaughlin. Gifts can be dropped off at the pastor's love offering box in the church lobby beginning next Sunday, April the 21st, the 28th, and May the 5th. You got those dates? Okay. Or on Sunday, the April the 27th, or May the 4th, the day of the events for the, both the men's and the women's event. There's an outside drop box outside of the church as well that we can utilize for this. If you're going to mail your offering to the church, utilize our church address. We do ask that you utilize the, um, <clears throat> put attention, Dr. McLaughlin, on the outside of your envelope, okay? And for those that might be challenged, our address for the church is 5640 <laughs> North Cooper Road. I had to look it up myself one day, so I know how to get here. I think the Lord just guides me in, but some days I have to write it down. So 5640 North Cooper Road, Indianapolis, Indiana, 46228. Gifts cannot be provided online at this time, keeping that in mind. In closing, we are grateful to be celebrating the seventh year anniversary of our pastor. He has provided us some good spiritual growth and leadership. So join us in lifting up, lifting them up in prayer, celebrating 
their gifts and expressing our gratitude for the seven years of service that they've blessed our church and join us for these uh, for the luncheons that we have planned. We're going to have some fun with this. Um, I think the men's it sounds like we might be able to get close to beating the women in this one here. Okay. I don't know why you guys are laughing because we've got at least 25 guys here today, so we're ready to lift some weight and do some fun, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And if you don't have money, pastor's love language is, um, I believe, words of affirmation, so tell them the sermon was great. I'm, I'm joking. Uh, uh, I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, at this time, it is time to give. Amen? Because the Lord loves a cheerful giver. We ask the uh, ushers to please come down. And our offertory song is grateful. Amen. Everyone together, our offertory prayer. Forgiving Father, we be faithful to you to give witness to your work in this world by sharing these gifts and offerings. We share your Son, Jesus, so that we may repent of our sins and be saved. Thank you for providing us with the example of how to place courageously your call of discipleship. And before pastor steps to the podium to give a word, our choir will bless us with trust in God.
trust him. That's why I trust him. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard. Let the church say amen. amen. This is my story and this is my song. Amen. Trusting in my Savior all the day long. We're so glad to see each and every one of you here this morning. And we're particularly glad to see those who are visiting with us and who have experienced the loss of loved ones, Sister Leela and Phyllis. And mourning loss of their son and brother, a husband. We support you and pray that you will trust in God and God will see you through. Am I right about it? Yeah. I was also glad to see Alexis all the way from Washington, D.C. I thought she said she came because she wanted to see her pastor, and so she, she might not have said that, but that's what I thought she said, and so, and we're also glad to see uh, all of you, and uh, I thought Kayla was the only one who was always on the verge of losing her job, but Mike P is in that same category. <laughs> they seem to not know what a worship leader is supposed to say and do but I'm gonna give him a little more chance to get it right.
We want to thank our choir this morning for really blessing us this morning. Under the leadership of Mark Pridemore, so we're so glad. Let us pray. Father, we are thankful for the joyous privilege of worship. We are thankful for your revelation and we thank you that from your word we can know you and know what you want to accomplish in and through our lives. We pray for humility for our heart that is teachable, that we may not only be listening, understanding, but will be believing and living your word out in our lives. So we pray right now for spirit-empowered preaching and spirit-enabled listening, that, Lord, you will be glorified through our lives. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The other thing I want to say, uh, I was meeting, we was meeting with Janice and Roscoe, and you will receive a letter in the mail, but we had a lengthy conversation. Well, this is not all true what I'm going to say, but anyway. <laughs> We had a lengthy conversation about the gift box and what would be the best way to really make sure people gave generously. And they said, and I did not say, they said, make the box black and gold. And so, <laughs> let me say to you, I don't care what color the box is, make sure what you put in is green. <laughs> That's what's important, the green and not the color of the box. There's a word from the Lord. And the scripture that we will be sharing with you this morning is from Paul's a letter to the church of Rome, Romans 6, 5 through 14. The screen has just to 12, but I want to go down to 14. And hear these words that's penned by the early secretaries of the church from the King James Version. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall have not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. In continuing our sermon series, The Cross Gives Hope to the World, we want to know that we are saved by God's amazing grace. It is nothing that we do. He does it all. You will be saved as you trust him by his grace. The choir reminded us of this fact as they sang, I trust in God. The grace of God in the Christian's life is not just a transaction, but a transformation. God is not here just to make us righteous in position, but he is also to make us righteous in practice. 
God's desire is not just for our salvation from the penalty of sin, but sanctification in a Christian's life. Sanctification is that process by which the life of God is more and more manifested in the believer's life. It is the process by which we are less like the world and more like his son. I like what John Newton has to say. He's the one who gave us that beautiful song, Amazing Grace. And John Newton wrote this. I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I wish to be. I am not what I hope to be. But by the cross of Jesus Christ, I am not what I used to be. Being saved by grace is not a license to sin. There is nothing that liberates someone from a life of sin like God's amazing grace. God's plans for our lives is victory. Not victory sometimes, but victory all of the time. Not victory in some places, but victory in every place. Uh, we are to have continual, contagious, and conspicuous victory. You see, in a Christian's life, there must be a change. There must be growth. There must be a transformation because that is the grace of God in your life. And today we're going to examine if the grace of God in, is intended to change my life, how am I to respond to the intention, the, to the grace of God in my life? Is, is there something I need to know? Is there something I need to respond to in order for the growth of the spiritual formation in me to be maximized? I think there is. And in this passage that we have just read, there are three simple words that you need to understand and accept. And if you don't take anything else away from this sermon, remember these three words. If we understand the meaning of these words, then we will understand the bounding victory that comes through amazing grace. Three words. Know, reckon, and yield. Knowing deals with the facts. Reckoning deals with faith. Yielding deals with function. The goal of this message on identity with the cross is to help Christians find their identity in the cross, to die to self, and to experience the power of Christ in their daily lives. Our identification with Christ is knowing our identification with Christ is a matter of fact that we must know. We have become one with the Lord Jesus Christ. We have become one with him because he became one with us. He took our humanity that we might take his deity. Not that we are gods, but that God lives in us. He came to earth that we might go to heaven. He took our nature that we might take his nature. We are identified with him. Identification tells us that when Christ died, we died with him. This deals with sin's power. You see, beloved, Jesus did not just take our sins to the cross. He took us to the cross. If he had simply died for our sins, then that would have still left us. And we are messed up people from the flow up to the toe up. I didn't say that right, but you got what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at y'all. Some of y'all saying, well, what is he saying? Uh, uh, well, well, catch this. The cross does not merely deal with our sin, but it deals with us. The source of our sins. When he died, he died for me. He died for you. Therefore, I died with him on the cross. Until you made that identification, you won't get it. This penalty, it deals with the penalty of sin. When a criminal dies, two things are true. There's no more trial. There's no more punishment. When he is dead, the penalty of law fails. It's over. The case is dropped. When dealing with the power of sin, we have the example of a slave and his master. A slave's master tells him what to do. 
But when the slave dies, the master has no more power over him. Satan has been the slave master. When we died on that cross, the penalty and the power of sin has been done away with and we are free from sin. Let me say that again. Satan has been the slave master. Satan has made it. You know, the devil make us do a lot of things. Now y'all trying to act all sanctified now. <laughs> Satan, the sin made us do some things we, as Paul said, the good that I would do, I do not do that which I do, I do not want to do. So sometimes it's slave that Satan has made us do some things. But when we died on the cross, the penalty and the power of the sin has been done away. We are freed from sin. As the old slaves said, we's free. Not only did we die with him, but we were buried with him. Now, some of us don't need, need to do like the early slaves did after they were free from emancipation. What did they do? They went right back. They said for a minute, we's free. Then they said, we don't know how to live like this and what to do. So they went back to the plantation master and said, master, what do you want me to do? We do the same thing with our lives. The Bible puts an emphasis upon the burial of Christ. It is the part of the gospel of Jesus. The person we were before we were saved dies and is buried with Jesus. Therefore, Satan cannot intimidate us with the bones of our old lives. One preacher said one time before, a lot of us got a lot of bones in our closet from the past, but Satan can't intimidate us from the bones of our past. Why, preacher? Because our sins are in the grave of God's forgetfulness. Not only did we die with him, we were buried with him, but we also have been raised with him. We are not with him still in the grave because he is not in the grave. You remember on Easter Sunday we preached that the tomb was empty. He has a life that the tomb could not keep. When Jesus came out of the grave, I want somebody to hear this. When Jesus came out of the grave, we came out of the grave to walk in newness of life. But I want to tell somebody this morning, leave your grave clothes in the grave. The things which you are or people tried to bury you in, kill you with, leave them in the grave. The devil thought he had you. I want somebody to understand this. If God has given you the grace to escape the grave, then he can give you the grace to change your garments. The scripture says, now Joshua was clothed with 50 garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with the change of raiment. From Zechariah 3 and 3 and 4, we, we talked about that in Bible study when we studied the minor prophets. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is that we are not just forgiven, patched up people, but we are brand new. We have resurrection life. There is a fact to believe. It is something we must know. But you can't know if you're never studying his word. If you never come to Bible study, you won't know who you is and who you is in Christ Jesus. There's a fact, there's something we need to know, and we need to know who we are in Christ Jesus. And we need to know this because when Christ came out of that grave, we came out of that grave. We came out of that grave. And I'm going to understand somebody. This is our identification. You need to know who you are in Christ Jesus. Dr. Tony Evans tells a story about one occasion a man went to a psychiatrist because he was having problems. They were serious problems. So he thought he needed to seek out a serious solution. Entering the psychiatrist's cozy and neatly decorated office, the man took a seat. 
Then he headed straight to his problem. Doc, he said. The doctor kept his eyes straight on him and nodded his head, urging him gently to continue. Doc, something's wrong. The man blurted out. What's the problem, sir? The doctor asked, trying to get more information. Well, every time I go to the supermarket, I am drawn to dog food. I just want to be around dog food. In fact, I love to eat dog food. The doctor shifted his weight in his chair and decided to search for some background on this man's issue. How long have you been struggling with this problem? The doctor asked patiently. Ever since, I was a puppy. <laughs> you see, how you perceive yourself will determine what you seek after. If you perceive yourself as a puppy, then you will naturally want to find some dog food. In other words, your identity is critical to your behavior, habits, and ways of operating. Many Christians today are confused about who they are, which in turn brings about confusion in how they are to function. We function the way we function because of how we perceive ourselves to be. This means that if your self-perception is incorrect, your function will be inerrant as well. But before we, and what I found is that many Christians see themselves as ain'ts instead of saints. And you can't do any reckoning before knowing. And you can't do any yielding before reckoning. So knowing, you know who you are. Your identification is with Christ. But the appropriation of Christ is a matter of fact. The word reckon is a bookkeeping term. It is to figure. It is not a matter of feelings, but it is a matter of fact. Once we have the fact, then we can begin to calculate on the fact. And we begin to act according to the fact. Reckoning is not closing our eyes and pretending. It is faith acting on what we know to be true. Knowing is a matter of faith, and reckoning is a matter of faith in that fact. When someone is saved, they say they believe Jesus Christ died for their sins. They were not there when it happened. They did not see it literally with their own eyes, but they say that it is true. Therefore, they reckon it. They stand on the fact that their sins have been paid for. You were not there. You were not there when Christ came up from the grave. What well, we believe, the fact, and therefore we reckon on it. And not only that he died for us, but we died with him. If the old man, the person we were before salvation is dead, then why do we struggle? Why are we not living in victory? Can we say this is death when something is moving, coming back alive again? In the natural death, if you was at Stuart's funeral home and you went to a funeral and you said the person was dead and you start seeing them move and get up and stand, you'll be running out of the funeral home and won't even tend to viewing. <laughs> the same way with our bodies if we are dead, but then we see some movement of life in the old and we seek going back to the old. But you said, I thought, Pastor, we were dead and why do I still have these feelings and this temptation? You're going to have it. Sin has not died even though you have died to sin. Sin is still in your body. It is still in my body. We have to get the fat straight. And then we have to learn how to reckon on the fat. We need to set aside our feelings and go about what we know to be true. The fact is that we were crucified with Christ. We were buried and have been raised again. Now we need to reckon on this fat. This is a matter of faith. My mother used to say all the time, I reckon so. What do you mean? What are you reckoning on? She's trying to take the facts and then think about it and reckon on it. 
The word crucified in the Greek language means that it took place once and for all. It never is to be repeated. The word reckon is in the present tense. and means that it's something we are to continue to do. And I want to tell somebody this morning, day after day, we are to reckon ourselves dead to sin and alive to God. Sin's penalty does not stand against us. Sin's power is broken over us. If we do not believe this, then we will never have victory. We must believe what he tells us to believe. And if this ever really gets into our hearts, then we will be delivered. There is a reckoning to believe and to put into our hearts by faith. And friends, we can walk out today thinking, knowing that you are dead to sin, alive unto Christ without really believing in it. And there is a danger because it is the connection between truth of God to change your life. You have to reckon it to be true. Now, some of you are saying, this is what scripture says, but frankly, I don't feel like I'm new. Dead to sin and alive to Christ. I don't feel victorious. So, preacher, you just talking about some stuff in the Bible. But I want to say somebody, something to somebody this morning. Most of our Christian living has very little to do with feelings. I don't think you like that statement, but it is a true statement. A lot of Christian living has very little to do with feeling. It ain't a matter whether you feel like coming to church. It is a matter of obedience that you should gather and worship. If I came to church on all the Sundays I felt like it, I probably wouldn't be here a lot of Sundays. <laughs> Am I right about it? Yes, I don't come to Bible study because every time I feel like it. Because when it's rainy and when it's cold, I don't feel like it. But I want you to understand something. Your Christian living is not based on how you feel. I don't think Abraham felt like it when he offered his son on Mount Moriah. I don't think he felt extremely excited. I don't think he got up that morning and said, wow, I'm going to kill my son today. I think he felt terrible. But he did not live his life based on feelings, but on faith. He counted God faithful, powerful, loving enough to resurrect his son. They did not live by feelings, but by faith. I don't think the Apostle Paul felt thrilled in a prison in Rome. I don't think he felt like, wow, this is a very nice hard bed. It could even break my back and I'm excited to be laying on this bed. I don't think he thought the food was what they offered was very nice. I don't think he felt that the handcuffs and the chains were very comfortable. But Paul, if you read the text, has great joys. Because why, preacher? Because he was not living by feelings, but by faith. I want to tell somebody this morning, you may not feel like you are dead to sin and alive to Christ. <clears throat> but that's not nothing, that has nothing to do with feelings. And Paul is saying, you might not have felt it, but this is the reality. You have got to believe it, count on it, stand on it, and have settled confidence in it. What God has already said, you stand upon his word and reckon it to be true. So sanctification begins not so much with what we do, but it begins with what God has already done. Know this. He has crucified your old person, given you a new life, and reckoned it. But when you meet with temptations, you don't have to give in to those temptations. When old desires rises up again, how many know old desires will rise up again? You thought you had killed that devil. But out of nowhere, you minding your own business. <laughs> Temptation to come by you and you're looking, oh my God. And you realize, oh, I'm, I, I'm just talking to myself. I just, I, I thought I had some church folks here who 
who were real with their faith. But I, I see I got some Holy Ghost rolling saints in here who don't know anything I'm talking about. Let me just preach to myself that, that old desires will rise up and every now and then we'll lose our temper and we'll get angry and we'll do some things and we'll go back. And sometimes we'll put down our religion just to tell somebody what we thought. And then we thought we had died to that. Uh, that. But I'm, I, I want you to know when that happens, you can know and reckon that you are free from the bondage of sin and God has given you a new life. And so I'm going to tell somebody this morning, all I'm trying to tell you this morning is like my mother would do, I want you to keep on reckoning. Just keep on reckoning. And you know it may rise up, but you say, I reckon I've been dead to Christ and I'm buried and I'm a new person. And the old, I may not look like it and I may not feel it right now, but I'm going to base everything on the word of God that I'm a new creature and I'm going to fake it until I make it because God has said, if old, I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. You better start reckoning. You, you better get like Medea with her calculator when she saw and was going to add up and stuff and she got that calculator and started reckoning and said this is what this is amount. I'm reckoning that I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. So, 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 so you know something. It's a fact. But now you got to reckon and base your living on that fact. Not your feeling. You, you may not feel all right, but with Christ Jesus, you're all right. Yes. Because I'm made perfect in Christ Jesus. I may not look new, but I'm going to feel new. I'm going to reckon it. Because Christ Jesus said, if anyone of you is in Christ, old things have passed away, and behold, new things and the last thing you got to know the facts and then you got to reckon and that's by faith do you know all we live is simply by faith so you got to get the fact knowing you got to have the faith and you got to reckon it to be true as my mother said I reckon so and then you got to yield that's the function. If sin reigns in us, it's only because we let it. It doesn't have to have any more. In this passage, the word members refers to our hands, feet, eyes, and tongue. This is the key that will deliver us. When we trust Christ, we get imputed the righteousness, but we also need practical righteousness. And this is done where there's a matter of fact, something we know. And then we reckon on that fact. We say that the fact is true. We reckon or believe it and take it by faith. Then there's a matter of function. And here's where the victory begins to yield to the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we yield? We can say to the devil that we do not have to obey him. Before we were saved, we could never say that. We can say to the flesh that we do not have to obey it. Before we were saved, we could never say it. We were slaves to Satan and the flesh. Now we do not have to obey them. We can choose against Satan and self and sin. We can say to the devil that our hands, eyes, and other members will no longer be his tools. You can tell Satan he's unemployed. Candace Satan and her son used to sing that song, Satan don't live here anymore. For they are no longer our hands, but they belong to Jesus. Before we had no power to yield. Now we know we can reckon. And there's the matter of function where we can say that we will not yield our members as instruments of unrighteousness. In the matter of victory, it is not our ability that counts. It is not our responsibility. But it is our response to his ability. We must choose. We cannot do without him, and he will not do without us. We must yield to the Lord Jesus Christ. When temptations come, we must yield, and we will yield. The only question is, which way will we yield? Will we yield to Satan, or will we yield to Christ? 
I want to tell somebody this more morning. Stop fighting temptation. Why fight a battle already lost? When we can enjoy a victory that's already won. Let me say that again. Stop fighting temptation. Why fight a battle already lost when we can enjoy a victory already won? Yield to Jesus. What good is the gospel of Jesus Christ if we do not know it, do not reckon on it, and do not yield to it? But when we yield, we will be free indeed. To know it's a matter of the heart, to know it's a matter of the head, to reckon it is a matter of the heart, to yield is a matter of the will. When do you, you do these three things, you will have victory. Do you know Jesus personally? If not, we can pray him today by asking him to come into your life. Three things for you to remember. You must know, you must reckon, and you must yield. That's why the cross gives us hope in a dying world. Do you identify with the cross? Because you know, you reckon, and you yield. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for the word that has gone forth, and we pray, God, that it will not return void. But there will be somebody who will say, Lord, what must I do to be saved? that I may identify with the cross. And for that, the people of God said, Amen. Amen. And as in the early church, they sang a hymn as they prepared to dismiss. What is the dismissal song? You may be seated as the choir leaders in the dismissal home, The Blessing.
beloved, the cross gives hope to the world. May you identify with the cross and your knowing it is a matter of the fact and your reckoning it is a matter of faith and is in your yielding it is a matter of the function. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the saints above, rest and abide with thee henceforth and forevermore. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Greet one another.